Says, get that India, big boy. Mike Asimo! Call an ambulance! Maybe call a priest! Oh, what a shot! What a shot! Campbell Killer! Hello and welcome back to a, well, somewhat special edition for an instant reaction for the tip sheet. As always, I'm your host, John, also known as 4020, joining me uh, on a set as we have a end of season catch up for round twenty seven, where the Eels have prevailed sixty points over the West Tigers twenty six, is my good mate sixties. But we're also joined by some special guests today, including Greg and Rob. We'll have them both on shortly to share their thoughts. But as always, first we check in with the big fella himself, sixties. Uh, fair, fair to say that our hearts were in our mouths at one point when the Eels took that very same margin of lead over the West Tigers with uh, not too dissimilar amount of minutes left to play, thirty two points, but they. Shut the door in emphatic fashion today. I don't know what you're talking about. I boldly called the match <laughs> with two minutes to go. I said, we've got it. And I, I think I was the only one here in this group that was prepared to call it with, with 120 <laughs> seconds left on the clock. Uh, uh, please, some kudos. Yes. It, look, i got to give the man his credit. He made the bold call. 120 seconds left. He shut the market on it and said, you know what? The Tigers are cooked. Third straight spoon, lock it in. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, normally at this time, John, I'd be sending a shout out to our sponsors, Star Partners Real Estate, Auburn, Norellan and Parramatta. But you know what? Right now, I'm going to throw to the man himself. Greg Okladnikov from Star Partners Real Estate. We've got him here. We're going to get your takes now on this uh, match, Greg. It's... I mean, obviously, you were very relaxed all the way through the game. <laughs> there were no dramas, um, mate. What's you? You were saying you you can't believe that we we were even in contention for the spoon. Thanks, but it's a massive honour to be on the uh, on the podcast. Very humbling to be here with two great Parramatta fans, but really enjoyable watching the game today. I think the thing about watching Parramatta today and the way we demolished the Tigers was the fact that Melbourne or Penrith would have done the same thing on them. And it just shows the talent that we have in the squad if we just stop the self-sabotaging mistakes in attack and defence. And I had a quick chat to Forty just with five minutes to go when we were safe. Mm -hmm. You called it with two to go. We thought we'd save <laughs> five to go. In that, um, how many mistakes did we make today? We, we made... One error in attack from in the first five minutes. We made a couple of defensive errors. We got beaten by a few great passes by Galvin. But really, we chased hard. We played hard. Didn't give away too many stupid penalties. And we didn't self-sabotage. Went a long way, didn't it, towards victory today. And it's been, the, unfortunately, the tail of the tape for our long stretch of this season. As you said, Greg, self-sabotage, self-inflicted wounds. Minimised them today and we put the Tigers to the sword as a result. Well, look at, you look at the season this year. I mean, the Dolphins and the Knights are playing for eighth spot and we're playing to avoid the spoon. And I think we, the talent that we've got, you know, I think 60 said in, at the start of the game that this year we've probably lost six or seven games where we've lost them. Mm -hmm. We led them. We've lost them. I'll say the hashtag again, N Darwin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but take out those five, six losses where we've thrown the games away, we're on 30 points, and we're playing in the eight. So I think Eels fans, you know, Eels fans in general and Eels fans of the throw can look forward to 2025 with, I think, some optimism. Yeah, I like that. I like the idea of a optimistic end to the season. Jason Riles coming into his own, taking control of the team and seeing what lies ahead on that horizon. Because like you said, there is talent in this team. And this is a team playing without Mitchell Moses, Junior Ball or uh, Jermaine Hopgood. The list goes on and on. Like they are missing a ton of stars and they're still putting up scores like they did against both the Tigers, the Dragons and slugging it out with Penrith and Melbourne in recent weeks. So yeah, they've, they've got some grit. They've got some gumption. Let's uh, see them go a bit better next year. I think definite. I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity next year. A little bit of polish, a, bit, a few less injuries, and we just cut out the mistakes. And just the way we put St. George, who I think are you know, average, the Tigers are below average, and we did a Melbourne on them. And I think yeah. that, that shows, and again, with the players that you mentioned who are missing, and then we lost Dylan with you know, 30 minutes to go and lost Will, so we had Bryce in the centres and Sean Lane defending somewhere, um, and we did a great job. Uh, before we get you uh, out of here and, and stop, you know, wasting your time. <laughs> <laughs> Never uh, waste a time. 60 points scored today. A lot of 
frenetic tries, saw a goal kick from a big man. Uh, what was your favourite moment from the win? Oh, I, I think there was probably no one standout moment, but I just think that as a team, just the whole overall game that we played, the way we played, and we really just played with enthusiasm. And with, I think with about 25 to go, it was 26-16 or 22-12. to Yeah, 12. you said that to me, you turned and said, The yeah. game was in the balance. We could have, you know, lost it at that point, but we just put them to the sword and that was probably the best part that we didn't do what we did last week with 10 to go and yep. turn it up. Yeah, complete 180 yeah. there. It's, uh, 100%. I think probably the first time this year that we've really sealed the deal in those last 10, 15 minutes and... It's a good way to end the season, I'll tell you that, rather than seeing the opposition score five, six tries on the run. So, yeah, nice way to wrap it up. And I'll wrap it up with, we'll be back to support the throw again next year. Thanks, Thank gentlemen. You, Greg. Do a great Love job. You, mate. And the whole team. Love you, mate. Well, thanks, Greg. I mean, that, what, what more can you ask for for a sponsor who's been with us now? I, I reckon it's, it must be uh, from the tw- start of the 2017 season, Greg. Would that would be about right? That you like that when we bumped into the back row of Ring Rose. That's, that's right, it. yeah. <laughs> Old Wenty <laughs> Park. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we need a cassette deck or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or internet. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and much appreciated, Greg. And um, as as we always say, we couldn't ask for better sponsors than Star Partners Real Estate. Uh, you've heard the passion there from Greg. Uh, not just a supporter of the Cumberland Throw, but uh, a really passionate Parramatta Real supporter. Yep. And, um, you know, when, you, when you've when you got uh, ourselves as Eel supporters and we've got the backing of Greg as a as a really passionate Eel supporter, you know, we couldn't be happier. So thank you, Greg. Perfect. See you next year, boys. <laughs> yes, yeah, thanks, Greg. See you next year indeed. And and a little bit of an insight too for, uh, for people about the um, – and, and a bit of praise, actually, that I'm going to give to Trent Barrett and the coaching staff for what we've seen over the last few months from the Eels. I, I said that I wouldn't go into any details about training while the season was still running and just a, about a few things, that uh, a few adjustments that they made really as we got into the last, I guess, at least six weeks of the season, John, and it's uh, the... It, it was almost like full circle that the, that the team has come. Many years ago, we back, well, back in 2017, you and I were privileged to be able to sit down with the assistant coaches, uh, Joey Grimer, uh, Steve Murphy, Peter Gentle. Uh, Pete Gentle, mm-hmm. and we were talking about what it was like for them when they first arrived at the Eels in 2014 and... You know, the team that was inherited by that co- by you know, Brad Arthur and that coaching group had won back-to-back wooden spoons. And one of the things that I'd noted at training was the amount of games that they played at training. A whole variety of games, but there was always games. And when we spoke to the coaches, they said one of the most important things was to get the players enthused about coming to training. And, uh, you know, basically turning up with a smile on their faces for what was, you know, for them in the previous seasons, I, I would imagine a real grind. Tough sell, yeah. You know, a, a really, as you say, a really tough sell. So lots of games were played. And it was, as I said, it was quite a variety of games that were there. Fast forward to about six weeks, six, eight weeks ago, I started to see the same thing happening at training, at Eels training at Kellyville, a lot more games that were being played. And when I say games, I'm talking about things like uh, Fiji and touch, uh, various varieties of soccer, like a four-way soccer game, um, Gaelic football. It, it, it's, you know, just this variety of games that were being played, um, not taking the place of training, but being a part of training. And often it, they'd, they'd hit the warm-up. Then from the warm-up, it'd be games and, and would be games for, you know, however long they uh, felt they needed to let their hair down, enjoy themselves. You'd see lots of laughs. Um, there's always competitiveness with professional rugby league <laughs> players, no matter what I, they're doing. So. I can think of a few players that would stand out for, you know, going hard for the win regardless oh, of what yeah, they're playing. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there was lots of celebrating with, it, you know, goals or tries being scored depending on, on what the game was. But 
what I think we've seen in the back half of the season has been that the team has had a crack. 100%. And, yeah. and, and whilst there's been elements of the execution that's let them down and maybe a little bit in game management, it the team, they were, they were definitely playing for each other. Um, they... Oh, look, I, I had a, a chat to a couple of the players, in, including Luca Moretti, and, and this was, you know, probably again about six, eight weeks ago. And I said, look, it's it's a real tough ask, you know, with Mitch Moses out for the rest of the season. Um, you know, it might end up, you know, it might end up being a battle at the end of the season with the Tigers. Prophetic words. And he just said straight out to me, mate, we won't get the spoon. It's not going to happen. And you know what? It's maybe it came down to this this last round, and probably because the Tigers got a couple of games that we didn't expect them to get. But uh, and we, by the way, we've got a, a watchdog <laughs> on duty here. So uh, if you do hear a bit of noise in the background, uh, we're just being kept safe here in uh, in in uh, in the wild suburbs in the of the Hills District. Mm-hmm. Mean um, cavoodle, mean. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, the look, as I said, they were playing for the they were playing for the jersey, they were playing for each other, playing, uh, and I'd like to think playing for the fans as well, as I'm sure that they were. Uh, pride obviously came into it, John, without a doubt. Yeah, but they were kept fresh. They were kept fresh in the mind. So the last part of the season wasn't a grind for them, and I think we saw that now. Uh, let me also make it clear, there was still training that was happening. Yeah, I mean, you, know. you don't go out and compete the way they've competed without actually applying yourself. So yeah, and that's clear. And other aspects of the of the game plan for this week that I was able to see, and actually, you know, they, they had particular target spotting up certain you know, players, spotting certain players, mm-hmm. and you would have seen that with some of the tries that were scored, mm-hmm. who they were running through, and uh, and that was the talk as they were going through their paces at training this week, you could hear the names being called that they were spotting. So, mate, that, as I said, look, I don't think I in, in the back half of the season I could have asked for more in, in terms of uh, how, the, how the team was prepared because I think it's a tough road to hoe when it might be perceived there's not too much to play for. Finals ostensibly out of reach. Um, but how do we keep the boys fresh in the mind? And, and that was basically a big part of it. Yeah, no, like you said, I think massive credit goes to Trent Barrett and the rest of the coaching staff and training staff because it's not an easy gig. Uh, the way things played out this year, the mid-season turmoil, the struggles on and off the field with injuries, bad luck, uh, you know, people being moved on, could have easily come to a complete collapse and instead they rallied. So uh, today... Uh, you, don't, you don't want to say it's the culmination of all that, but there was a lot of hard work that went in there from both the playing group and all their support and auxiliary staff. And I don't think you you post 60 points today uh, without having a real crack, not just in the short term, but across that entire stretch. So really well done to Trent Barrett and company there. Let's start with this game now, mate. Break it down. Talk about where we are. Got it right. A couple of hiccups along the way, uh, but the Eels 60 over the West Tigers 26 out at Campbelltown Stadium. That win not only lifts the Eels to not the Wooden Spoon or the Mariana Trench Trophy as we've adopted this week, but it gives them a, a fair chance of coming third last of what it's worth to the ladder watchers out there as we play. Sorry, as we record right now, Roosters up 6 0, 17 minutes played. Uh, Roosters win by any margin gives the Eels third po- or third last, not third place. It'd be nice if it gave us third place. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's look at the team stats here, mate. Uh, 11 tries, 2-5. Obviously, a lot of points scored here. 20 clock. tries in the last two weeks, John. Yeah, well, the clock's been thrashed two weeks in a row. Uh, 84 and 86 points scored uh, in the last two weeks. Uh, for the Eels, well, it's an extensive list, but we've got a Mike Acevo double, Dejan Arce, Brendan Hands, Will Penasini double, Bryce Cartwright, Quinton Gufferson double, which also netted him his 100th career try in the NRL. So well done to the captain there. Tremendous way to close out the season, along with... Fittingly, the big man, Reagan Campbell-Gillard, getting over. And then Joey Lusick closing out the scoring in the 73rd minute with Reg potting a conversion for that try. Dejan Arce kicking, was it? One, two, three, four, five, six, six. And Quinton Gufferson kicked the goal too. I was I missed that one. but uh, So we've got three different converters here. 
Uh, the key stats, Eels ahead in possession, 54% in their favour, time of possession, plus four minutes. Nice, effective completion rate, mate, 76%, 33, 43. Speaks to what Greg was talking about, uh, where we mitigated or limited the self-sabotage this week, and lo and behold, get a big win. Uh, Eels ahead in every key attacking stat, except tackle breaks. More runs, more run meters, more post-contact meters, nine line breaks to five. Better average set distance by over plus 10 metres a set. So that's how dominant they were on the ground. Uh, the Tigers, though, half a second faster on the play of the ball speed. That's the para classic, isn't it, mate? Dominate all the key attacking stats. Give up the faster play of the ball. Eels, 17 off lows to 10. So again, dominating second phase play. And then getting down to the effective tackle rate. Neither team particularly good. Eels, uh, a tick over 80%. The Tigers, a tick under 82%. So plenty of missed and ineffective tackles today, which speaks towards... 86 points being scored, no surprises there. But uh, crucially, the Eels minimised their errors. Only 13 conceded to the, the Tigers, 17. Uh, but in saying that, the Tigers actually were ahead in discipline for penalties and six against. Four penalties conceded the Parramatta's five, and then they gave up two combined six against the Parramatta's four. So that's the uh, team stats there. There are some individual stats, which uh, I don't know if you want to take me through there because a couple of players cracked 200 alongside some uh, really strong efforts across the park. Uh, but off road over to you now. Uh, Eels convincing victors, uh, the opposite of last week, which is really nice to talk about. What stood out to you on this one, mate? Well, for a start, I just wanted to throw the stat at you because we were talking through the game about where does Sivo sit with tries scored this year? And I think he's come in at 17 in I 12 games. 17 and 12, yeah. And he nearly had 18, if not for an actual great Charlie Staines grass cutter. So the man is... He hasn't been available for large stretches this year due to injury, mostly injury. There was a suspension too, I think. But it's been a lot of injury. But to his credit, he's actually posted, or A, a lot of tries, and B, this last run, and even the run before he got inj the, the most recent injury, I think bookending that injury, he's played some good football. You know, at the end of last season, Sivo turned in his, his best game yeah, of the year in the Penrith. final yeah. match against Penrith. I, I wonder if much like seeing the try line when he's in the 20-metre <laughs> zone, when he sees the season's end... Winds up. He's really winding up, yeah. Look at a finish the season on a massive high. He, he's done that. He's still under contract for next year. There's certainly been some talk around Sivo being moved on, a bit of talk around him with rugby... If you had this version of Mike Sivo on a regular basis, you would never consider no. letting him go no. because he, he was just devastating. And the thing was, he was devastating from his own end of the field. Yeah. The, the kicks that he was receiving, uh, that dropout that he took... 35 was, metres out. He, he raced 35 metres out yep. and took that. It wasn't a short dropout. He no. made it one. No, so he he had moments where he just looked completely unstoppable. So uh, shout out to Micah for the way he's finished the season. Of course, if he's here next year, we want that version of Micah Sivo every week. We don't want to be having a discussion about his form wavering or it, or, or his his carries in uh, you know his meter work, yard, sorry his yardage work, uh, not not being what we need it to be. So, um, yeah, but what a what a game from him today. What can you say about Regan Campbell-Gillard? I mean, this was probably his swan song with the Eels, unfortunately. Yeah, I think the goal kick all but indicates a departure from the club. Yeah, and he's he's been the Iron Man of the season, playing in all 24 games, uh, given his all in every one of those games. He's a player who's probably worth around every cent that he's paid for the Eels. Uh, people might debate, you know, that his, his contract is a little bit more than what it should be. But if he's performing like this on a regular basis, which we've pretty much seen this season, there's no discussion about him him leaving. Unfortunately, as I believe, he's in the, he's in the position where the, the Eels can get close to maximum value for a contract offer from elsewhere if if uh, Reg accepts the move. And I think that's basically how it's playing out. He, he was looking at a move at the end of next season. Well, they've moved it forward for a season 
I don't know about you, John. I, I'm I'm sorry to see Reg go because you you know those props like that um, they're as rare as hen's teeth, and there's still a place for in the in this game where we've got a lot of mobile forwards. When you've got someone playing like Reg has been playing, there's still a place for them in the in the modern game. I mean, a pack's always going to have a place for a hard man that runs tough north south and sets a tone in defense. That's exactly what Reg does. Look, I, I, we spoke about this, and I think I might have wrote about it. My memory gets hazy when it comes to content creation these days, but he played 107 caps for the Eels, if my notes are correct. And that pairing between him and Junior Barlow, they fell agonizingly short of that breakthrough premiership, the the title that would have cemented their legacy, I think, long-term. But fans should really appreciate what we saw between the partnership of Junior and Reg. Uh, I know it. there was a bit of a a low point or a trough this year uh, with injuries and disruption, all the other stuff between the, the two of them and Junior getting put to the bench and whatnot. But in their peak, they were probably as good as any front row pairing that we've had at the club. And they gave us some outstanding football combined. Junior obviously still with the club, but it's very much bittersweet to see Reg go. And, and the sweet part of that is by far the minimum or the smaller side of that margin. Him leaving obviously gives the club and Coach Riles the opportunity to make signings that can you know, better balance the squad. But, geez, it's tough to see him go because, like, like you said, there is still a place in this team for him. And you can see the camaraderie and, and the love that the other players have for him when he – kicked that conversion and was, I mean, they made the poor man run back to the, the goal line 100 metres to get back into position to field the kickoff. But you could you saw Joe Offengar, he saw a number of players come in and give him plenty of love. So very much uh, it's going to hurt the same go, hurt the same pull on what we suspect is the Red V next year. Uh, but he signed off in emphatic fashion. Great game, scored a, a wonderful little try at the end there, got the kick a goal. So probably as poetic a finish as you can get when you're competing for the wooden spoon in the final round. John, what I am glad about is that the season's not going one game longer because I would hate to think about what the team might look like oh. next week given the injuries that struck during the game tonight. I mean, we saw... It's a nervous way for the preseason. Now, oh, though. yeah, absolutely. Um, let's have fingers crossed about both um, Dylan and Will. Um, I don't know how soon we're going to get word on on their respective injuries. But, I mean, it, Dylan certainly didn't look good No, out on the field. You're just having a bit of a, a check now to see if there's any word that's coming through at the moment. But I guess that's the other thing where there's praise due for this result because in the end we've got um, a, a completely disjointed back line with um, Dejan Arcee gone... Dylan Brown gone, so both the halves, and then Will Penasini gone out in the centres. So we've got um, one of the dummy halves in Brendan Hands playing in the halves. We had, I, I gather, was Blaze in the in the halves? Then yeah, as well, Blaze five eight left, left half. I mean, yeah. Kelmer at left centre. Yes, yes. So and we and then we also had um, Bryce Cartwright playing at right. Right centre. Right centre yeah. in place of Will. So it was it was quite... Um, look, I'll tell you what I was glad about. For the most part in that, in the latter... Well, for the entire game, really, I'm the Tigers didn't throw too much in the way of unexpected attack. There, there wasn't a great deal of um, uh, playing unstructured football and you know my concern about the Eels defending against unstructured football. Galvin well he he had a few tricks up his sleeve mm-hmm. and that was about as close as they got. He, he had that little dab in behind the line with a kick for uh, their first try he was really exploring on the Tigers left and although there are a few passes there that looked a bit dodgy not necessarily from him but there was some forward passes I thought when the Tigers were stringing down their left of edge, there, down, yeah. down their, their left edge, but um, look, uh, yeah, I, I think there's quite a bit of praise that's due for the Eels in in the way that they were able to adjust with all those injuries happening in the second half. Goodness knows we would not have wanted to see it last week with how oh. how things went, um, but we certainly wouldn't have wanted the season to go another week longer because. 
you honestly don't know what they would have done in terms of uh, putting a team together next week. Um, special mention, of course, to um, players like Will Penasini, who got 207 running metres. Uh, Blaze was up at 146 running metres. Um, Micah was only down for 112, but it, the damage he it's did felt violent, like double that. Violent 112 metres. Yeah, yeah, absolutely violent. I mean, before he got injured, Dylan Brown was up to 101 running metres. Mm-hmm. Um, Reg, 138. Um, Kelmer, a massive, massive 203 run metres. But get this, 95 post-contact metres. He's nearly run 100 metres post-contact, John. I mean, that's just enormous. Um, Cardi had a really good game, uh, 124 run metres. But he just has that ability to pull something out of the... Out of the a trick out of the bag, you know his the intercept and putting Will Penasini away. Uh, there was also that magical pickup that he had near the sideline as well. Uh, he can just do things that other players can't do, and a player that I think might be close to being a lock in for the Ken Thornett Medal, Joe Offengawi. Mm-hmm. It's hard to see players that will top him, given that a couple of the key players had injuries this year. Um, but he's got to be well and truly up there for a Ken Thornet medal voting. Um, he's He's got to win some sort of award at uh, at those that presentation, which I believe is next week. Um, John, at this stage, I'm going to I'm going to throw over to a guest. Well, we're actually a guest in his house at the moment, Rob, who, uh, for people who enjoyed listening to the podcast when we were, I guess you'd almost say in the early stages of of the regular podcast, was uh, we used his voice talents for a little bit of fun from time to time as a, uh, a West Tigers supporter, a, a, a a much maligned, a, a, a deeply pained, um, a rather sad individual. And we won't get him to disguise himself as such a West Tigers supporter because he's sitting here in his Eels gear. But um, I might throw it over to Rob to get his takes on this uh, match. Mate, thank you for hosting us here tonight. Oh, you're more than welcome, uh, Craig and John. Um I think the uh, the big result of the night was every time I went to get a new <laughs> beer, we scored. How many how many tries this was? It four uh, or five. <laughs> I've, it was had, I've had actually, plenty of tries. Tonight, actually, probably. actually <laughs> impressive. Yeah, as I said to you, six dalian points to Rob. He absolutely absolutely killed it. It was uh, uncanny. Yeah, and if I knew that's what how I easy how to easy do, it was. I, yeah, I'll be doing yeah. that all year next yeah. year. We'll see how it how it goes. But uh, it was it was a great result. I, I love the work that you guys do. I'm in awe of your ability to remember the game uh, as well as you do. And maybe that's where my problem begins and ends. I, <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I, I, I drink too much during the, during the games. Um, Sounds like a smart strategy of some of the stuff that Para does. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that uh, no, was a great result. I, I really in, enjoy watching that sort of game. I was nervous even to the last 10 minutes. And... Uh, I was even nervous uh, when uh, I think it must have been Yoko called you at two <laughs> minutes uh, to the end, and you called it. But um, yeah, no, I, and I love having you guys over, so you're you're more than welcome to come anytime. It was funny we we had a bit of a roundtable just ahead of kickoff. I think it was Quint, Greg, Craig, myself, obviously yourself too, and we're talking that the build up for this game was kind of unlike anything we'd seen, and you know all the talk about Spoon Bowl and whatnot. But it was a sold out crowd at Campbelltown. Uh, very raucous crowd. We heard a lot of Tigers chants for about 60 minutes until the Parachant took over, which was good to hear. Uh, but yeah, for, for a game where the stakes were so low, you know, subterranean low, as, as we've been talking about, yeah, it was funny to see everyone get so hyped for it. It was, I mean, I know they call it the Spoon Bowl, but it was a very entertaining, I suppose, preamble 
into a very satisfying finish. I think you, you may be underselling it a bit, John, because a lot of people count how many spoons a team Yes, has. they're, they're very, very quick. how many seconds. Very second quick lasts. to bring up the cutlery debate, exactly. Uh, you know, there's a lot to, lot at stake. And when you're uh, – it's pride, really, in the end. Uh, and I think – even when we got ahead and the guys just kept on pushing, you know, just kept pushing and pushing for more points. Um, that's pride, I think. And because, you know, how many players did we have out? Um, how many players did we lose this game? I mean, we, we obviously got the advantage with uh, Apisai Coruscant getting correctly sent to the Simbin for the tackle on Gufferson. But the, uh, the footy gods weren't kind to us today. They gave us a lot of injuries on top of all those season injuries. And the other thing that I was going to approach a few 60s, and we can obviously talk with Rob about it, is that the Tigers always punch up to us. They always play their best against us. They obviously circled this game. They did it earlier this year, played some great football there. Lockie Galvin had a big game in round, was it three, four, three? I think it was when uh, Moses went out uh, the week before. Um, and yeah, they, they always turn up and the Eels absorb some pressure because there was a point in this game where Galvin had sort of spearheaded a two-try comeback we gave away a penalty, they scored, we kicked out in the fall, they scored again, they had momentum in the game, and then we, we managed from there, it was largely taken by the throat in a stranglehold. Yeah, look, the the way that the Eels sort of uh, dug in a little bit at the beginning of the beginning of the game, we've seen too many of these recent games where that's the difference. Yep. We don't come back, we, we start to capitulate and we let things go. And yeah, look, it was only against the Tigers, but it... it Bodes well for next year. Hopefully these guys that have got their injuries are, are only mildly inconvenienced and uh, they, they train through the off-season and we hit things coming good next year. Yes, indeed. And I think we'll, we'll let Rob off the hook there so he can go yeah. actually enjoy his I own home. Back to you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, mate. Uh, great to have you on board. All righty. I don't know where you want to go from here, mate, if you want to start wrapping things up or you want to talk about some of the individual moments here. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, there is cause for celebration, isn't there? Because it's not so much about avoiding the spoon because in the end, I know we were speaking of Rob talking about how teams or fans are always quick to bring up you've won X spoons and whatnot. But it is about finishing the season on a positive note in that transitional process for Coach Riles. There is a number of number of players that stood up tonight. You mentioned the big number getters there, but there are guys like Luca Moretti who came out with a point to prove, played great football. Guys like Kelma Tuolangi who have continued to consolidate on really strong mid-season form. And, they're going to give a new coach some intriguing opportunities or possibilities heading into this preseason. Absolutely. And the thing was, with a couple of those blokes that you just mentioned, they actually gave a hint as to what they were going to produce this year in the preseason. Because uh, Joe Offen Gowie, he just looked sensational all through the preseason. I think I made comment on you did. his levels of mm -hmm. fitness and. Uh, and given that that was his first actual preseason with the Eels and his leadership role that he assumed on the training track, uh, Kelma was a, a real spot at the start of the season as well. Uh, maybe not quite in the league that Isaiah Papali'i stood out, but you just knew, you could see the, the lines that uh, Kelma was going to run and that he was going to be a difficult proposition to tackle, but it was a matter of him fitting into the uh, the Eels' systems. And and you know what? Those systems, you know, they let, let's face it, it went out the window a bit with the, um, the mid-season sacking of BA. And it was a season that we've talked about many times. It felt like it had just gone on for too long, but... I'm going to come back to it. The, I, I, I think the coaches played it smart with how they were with the players and how, mm -hmm. how they prepared them. And uh, you and I spoke about it with, uh, you know, because there were questions raised, with the team fit enough? And I said, look, they're match fit. They don't need to be any fitter than what they, that, what they are at the moment. Now, obviously, I'm not an NRL coach and Jason Riles might have a different idea about that maybe he's got different ideas about individuals and individuals levels of fitness but when you look at at games like this where the team stays in control for the majority of the game I, I don't think there was a point in that game where you go well are they fit enough in this and you might have at the end last week against the Dragons but that was more 
that was more to do with, I think, headspace, as I said last week, that as soon as that first try was scored, the heads went down. And it was like, you know, here we go. There's going to be more tries scored. It, was a, it came through on the body language. Um, but, again, as I say, I think they got it right at the end of this season with keeping them nice and fresh, keeping them enthused about training as best they could. And look, it's a hard it's a hard season, mate, when you've got both the senior grades with no chance of making finals football, and you've got players in maybe in the reserve grade that um, you know might feel that they should have been getting game time, and that you know that's and that's well and truly up for debate whether they should have got some game time or not. But you know when you've got when you've got Victory being so rare across both senior grades, how do you keep their how do you keep their minds fresh? How do you keep them enthused about what they're doing? Um, somehow the Eels hung in there and kept the effort up over the over the last um, six weeks. They've had what is that three wins in the last six weeks? Warriors, obviously tonight, Dragons, uh, and then obviously near victories over Penrith. Yep, and then holding their own against Melbourne. So they've definitely held up their end of the deal on that. What what initially looked like a bit of a murderer's row, didn't it? When we had the Roosters, Melbourne, Penrith uh, in that run alongside obviously West and uh, the uh, Dragons. But the Warriors are also a, what were deemed to be a formidable team coming into the season. So it, it certainly wasn't a layup to get through this uh, gauntlet and then get you know into a position to avoid the spoon. And they did it. So, Well, mate, we're going to talk about the season as as a whole on uh, separate, podcasts yeah, that, are, pod. that are upcoming. So, um, quick question for you. What was your moment of the match in this particular game? Ooh, you know what? I, in a match that had quite a few swinging moments that went Parramatta's way, uh, I, I love the Marcus Eva kick return. That was just visceral and violent. But I think the one that sort of really took the air out of the balloon was the Bryce Cartwright intercept. Uh, he read that the Tigers have been looking to set up the outside inside play a couple of times. They nearly had one with uh, the fullback Heath Mason in the first half. And this time it was, uh, gosh, it was Galvin to, I think it was Latu Fainu was uh, lurking on the inside there, if I recall correctly. And Bryce read it like a book. And just that, that was crucial. Uh, completely sucked the wind out of any sort of comeback they had. He played it beautifully with the intercept into a quick feed to Will Penasini. And Will, you know, duly obliged and scored the try. I think that might have been one of the occasions where Rob was getting a drink. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not sure who was the most instrumental in that play. Um, I was going to mention that one as well. Uh, probably the funniest one was Gutho's in-goal intercept for the, uh, oh, for the try. What about, what about Davey Clemmer arcing up over that? Oh, come on, get off it. Um, Kelmer's offload uh, oh, off, off the ground was it between the legs? It, I don't know if it was between the legs, but he had about half the team on his back, and then he sort of just gets the extendo arm underneath and gets a really quality bounced pass to uh, Dejan Arsiway. And credit to Dejan, he was actually awake to it. He wasn't looking for the turnover play there and getting ready for to defend. And then uh, obviously Micah, in typical fashion, icing it through a shoulder charge. By the way, that uh, the bunker didn't really want to have to deal with, but. Yeah, that was a fantastic moment there. And we were sitting there saying, you know what? That's a fine end to the set. Just take the tackle. And then he found a way to just rest that ball through the uh, contact. For listeners here, uh, Fordy just got the one arm out and showed and demonstrated to both Rob yeah. and I how that yeah. how that offload happened. Yeah, the, 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 the arm complex, extended. Complex mechanics of getting that arm down and swinging it up. Yeah, <laughs> lawn bowl, squirrel grip, whichever way you want to look at it. Oh, look, you know, the, we we're going to have to probably go to our podcasts uh, being on Zoom or, or something like that, John, because there's there's far too much that happens in the way of the the physical, the <laughs> physical entertainment that you provide. It's, oh God. <laughs> uh, okay, look, I think we're probably at the point of wrapping up. Uh, three, two, ones. This is going to be – it feels weird to have a contentious 3-2-1 in a win as big as this, but I think I'm going to be voting for the heart a couple of times here and maybe overlooking some outstanding efforts elsewhere just to 
give uh, either a farewell vote or a sort of career nod vote this week. And, and uh, funnily enough, it's going to guys that usually poll as well. So maybe I should do the reverse and say, you know what, you don't get points despite having a sign-off game or making a, a milestone amount of, of tries. Uh, I'll let you take the three points this week and then I'll, I'll punch in with the three too. Okay, well, we'll look, we might also get uh, Rob's takes on this as well. Look, my, my three points, it is a tough call. Um, I, I, I am going to give it for slight sentimentality, but, but definitely for workload, uh, Regan Campbell-Gillard. Like he's, he's just been a colossus. He's been a memorable player for the Eels. He kicked his... I'm assuming that's his first NRL it's goal. It's got to be his first NRL goal. If, if it isn't, then something's gone wrong <laughs> somewhere yeah. down the road. The, no the, disrespect to Reg. The, uh, the disappointing factor was that he didn't go the toe poke. Yes, with that I, was, I was championing for the toe poke, but it was just a one step and uh, smack it in around the corner. Yeah, he style. just kicked it with a plum. Yeah, he? like he's been like he's been a goal kicker most of his life. He was probably in his younger years a a ball playing goal kicking halfback. It's hard to imagine it, but I, I reckon somewhere in Reg's distant past, if he wasn't in that position, he dreamt that he was playing in that position. And uh, he certainly found the, the skills tonight. Um, but you look, besides, you know, the, the fancy stuff, 35 tackles, only two missed tonight as well. Uh, Rob, we'll go to you for your three points. Uh, okay, thanks, Greg. Um, I, th- I think Kelmer just had a, had a great game. Like just a, what he does each week, just a powerhouse down the middle, tuck it under your wing and then not knowing that the other opposition not knowing whether he's going to get that ball away or whether he's going to bust that tackle oh, he's he's my three points easy yeah I'm with Rob here I won't, I refuse to let sentimentality take over my points I I reflected on it and I'll, I'll give out honorable mentions I guess uh, so I'll be a bit of a, a brutal cynic there Kelmer dominated tonight uh, and he, as he has for almost a third of a season when you sort of factor in that injury slash suspension he was killing it in the midpoint of the year, gets that uh, time off by way of either injury or suspension, regardless of how it plays out, comes back and doesn't lose a beat. In fact, the only real negative he had was against the Broncos, where through a fault of trying too hard, he made that charge down. So that's the biggest negative we've got against him. I am really keen to see what he does next year under Coach Riles. Uh, he is looking like a physical phenom out there on that left edge. Defenses are struggling to contain him. Gets my three points. Two points. Uh, I will go for a fellow 200-meter cracker tonight, and that's on the back of an injury too. And I'll say this because he had a bad start. We were all going, oh, no, Will, what's happening when he drops an early pass for a try? And instead he turns around and produces a barnstormer. He's probably his best game of the season. Uh, he gave the Tigers all sorts of fits. They did throw a lot of him in defense. That left edge of Galvin uh, asked a lot of questions. And they had some success there, but I think they actually did a good job minimizing some of that midfield damage. So I will give Will the two points and an update from NRL physio who he's not obviously diagnosing because he's not on the spot, but mechanically the injury points towards an, a potential MCL uh, primary concern there, which not great, but far better than an ACL in that regard. So we're obviously fingers crossed, knock on wood, whichever superstitious uh, sort of uh, make you feel better mannerism you want. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, we hope that Will was good, but there is no word in Dylan yet either. So I'll go back to Rob now for his two points. Yeah, well, for two, it's really hard when all the players play really well tonight. Like there was no one you stand out and go, why was he on the field? You know, they all played really well. But uh, for me, it's Joe. Joe O is just a, a, another another forward you can count on to just tuck it under under his wing, push through for the for the team. And I'm surprised he hasn't had more three pointers uh, this year. He was a really good buy um, for the for the team, and tonight was no different. You just got a good old reliable Joe, and um, I'm giving him my two points. Yeah, my two points. Well, we're we're gonna I think circle around a lot of the same players. Uh, my two has to go to Kilmer as well. It, the threat that he offers on the edge is just um, – it, it's something that I think the Eels are going to take great advantage of next year. You can have him targeting opposing halves 
on with those lines that he runs. And the thing is, he just completely refuses to surrender in the tackle. As Rob was saying, he's got that offload, so he can he can either play a very conventional running back rowers role, or he's got that offload in him because he just uh, is able to stand strong in the in the tackle. So he gets my two points. John, um, throw to you for your one point. Yeah, one point. Any number of players could have gotten it today. Uh, Joe, Guffo, I'm just trying to think. Moretti, uh, Lane was also sold as well. Um, there was even a, a, a big effort try saver from Sean Lane at one point in the second half. Uh, he came from the inside down that right edge to snuff out a ball coming back on the inside through some second phase play. You love to see it. But the one point, I will let a little bit of sentimentality creep in here going to the big fella. RCG signs off in what we, we do think he's signing off, obviously, in uh, very, very high fashion. Scores a try, kicks a goal, 140 metres, 35 tackles. The quintessential Reagan campbell Gillard effort. So well done to the big man. And uh, as always, if he does end up leaving the club, we wish him well, except when he plays the Parramatta Eels. Love what he brought to the Blue and Gold. And I will always look back on that partnership between him and Junes as one of the premier bookend pairings that we've had. Mate, I... I'm going to go for another forward because I think the work that was done through the middle and on the edges really brought the win home for the Eels. And I'm going to go the one point for Joe Offengawi. I've already talked him up quite a bit. I think he's in contention for the Kenthornet medal. Mr. Consistency. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, for me, it's an easy lock-in for the one point. So... Um, yeah, big shout out tonight uh, for those three players: uh, Reg, Kilmer, and Joe. And, and finally, we, Rob, your one point, mate. Well, the backs need to have a bit of a look in on this. And <laughs> uh, if you're going to pick one, uh, I think it's Micah. And you know, the the turnaround in the last three games of of his season. Um, I don't know if somebody's telling him that you know his contracts needs to be um, proven. Yeah, but, played uh, up to exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and and that's sad, and we shouldn't have team uh, players in our team if that if that is the difference. But a difference he has made, and he has been great. And and tonight was almost um, a, a faultless Micah. You know, there's no fumbles off like last week or anything like that. And uh, he made a lot of meters and was did some brave plays on that. You know, taking that. Uh, kick um, that brought it down to a 35 meter uh, kick you know um, he was a, a cannonball like he should be and uh, did good things so that's he gets my one yep I like that and not to be the bearer of bad news but uh, I think coming out of the presser at least this is the feedback I'm getting via uh, some mates there are concerns mechanically that it could be an ACL for Dylan so that would uh, certainly sour a big win there uh, but it's not official. But like I said to you when we were watching the coverage, they were doing the leg drop test on him, which is always a concern uh, because it's a pretty consistent means of uh, at least preliminarily testing the ACL being damaged. And we now wait with beta breaths for Dill to pull through. But if he has done an ACL, he's going to be out for a long, long time into next year. And uh, it's going to put a lot of burden on the halves again. And it feels like we just can't have nice things in that six and seven, can we, fellas? Well, that'd be taking us through to, what, probably like May, June, by the time he would... He and then not expecting him to be at his best coming back either. Yeah, so oh, I don't even want to think about that, mate. I, honestly, I don't. Um, look, what can I say? It's um, We're able to... I, I was hoping we could just wrap up on the high of a win. <laughs> um, and Got to keep it real sometimes. Oh, right? mate, you know, like, as you said, sometimes you feel like... Eels just aren't allowed to have nice things. But, um, yeah, look, fingers crossed that it's not or, you know, fingers crossed for a, a, a rapid rehab, if that's ever possible with an ACL. I don't think it is. But, um, look, really the result that we wanted to finish the season on, an emphatic win, a win that can hopefully keep the players' spirits up nice and high, have them champing at the bit for the pre-season to start. Um, big efforts from the forwards tonight. Uh, backs did their job. John, I don't think there's too much more that we can 
at at this point, um, except again a shout out to our sponsor, Star Partners Real Estate, Auburn, Norellan and Parramatta. Thanks to Greg and the team for everything that they do in supporting us. Thanks to Rob for hosting the Cumberland Throw here at his house tonight. Uh, shout out to uh, our Cumberland Throw associates who are out who are out at Campbelltown tonight to watch the game live. Hope you had a great time out there, fellas. And uh, John, thank you for another full season of instant reactions. And as I always say, go you mighty eels.